your eye is just sucked right down into our main character. This art looks like video game concept art. And I thought in a lot of the Western superhero comics I read, there was some over-the-top muscles, but nothing compares to the stuff I'm seeing in this comic. The list of manga artists that people have requested I talk about in this series has continued to grow and grow and grow, but the most common suggestion that I've been getting lately has actually been for a comic that's not a manga, but a manhwa, which is the sort of Korean equivalent of manga. And seeing as how I was looking into one manhwa, I figured I might as well look into a few. So in this episode, I'm gonna cover a bunch of the more requested manga artists, as well as some very impressive artwork from some manhwas that I've been looking into. Also, for anyone new to this series, in the pinned comment, I'm linking every previous episode, including a list of the artists I've covered in each episode. So before requesting anyone, check there, because I might have covered them already. But without further ado, let's get into the first art of the day. The art in solo leveling is just so cool looking. And the premise of the story is really great and leans into some really epic artwork. It's just portals opened up to dungeons that have lots of monsters in them, and hunters have to go into those dungeons to fight off the monsters to make sure they don't come out into the real world. Now, one of the early very interesting things that I found when I was going through some of the issues is how the composition has to be thought about very differently because this comic is being produced as a webcomic. And for webcomics, you don't read it page by page, you read it by scrolling down through the page. So this means, well, composition rules still apply, the artists have to think about the composition of their images very differently because things aren't being revealed in one big page flip, they're being revealed in a scroll. So this leads to a lot of, at least in this series, some very tall panels that you see more of as you scroll down through it. And specifically, this was really cool in an issue where our main character was fighting off this giant snake creature, because the snake, having a really long body, worked really well to lead us down through some of these really tall, interesting panels. But of course, the main most interesting thing about this series, which likely anyone watching this can tell by just looking at this artwork, is how crisp and clean it is. In fact, when I went to first look at some of the artwork for this series, because so many people suggested it, I saw the artwork and I thought, oh, okay, this is obviously artwork from the anime that's come from this series. It's not the actual manhwa artwork. But there isn't an anime for this series yet. This is just what the artwork looks like. And it consistently looks this great. And something that leans into this really crisp look is the fact that the artists are doing this digital over traditional, and they're really leaning in to some of the digital effects for the series. Some people have very strong opinions about digital versus traditional art. I think most artists are generally impartial, although they'll have one that they do more so than the other. Personally, I always work digitally just because I like the digital art process better and I like being able to correct stuff more easily. But in terms of looking at other people's art, I'm totally impartial. I'm very easily impressed by both digital and traditional artwork. And really, at the end of the day, the thing that matters most is the artist's skill set, and they can bring that to digital or traditional art, and it's going to show through either way. But for this series, I think digital really was the way to go, because our main character gets this ability early on to see this sort of heads-up display that gives him quests that he's supposed to do throughout the day to get better and better and improve. And with a mechanic like that, that should look very modern, being a core part of the story, digital really is a better way to go in this case. And one thing that I particularly love, and this is me showing some of my bias, is how they'll often use gradients on the characters' faces. And just in a lot of the art in general, but gradients, I personally think, look really nice, having just a slight, even in this case, going from a dark blue to a lighter blue down the character's face. It helps keep the art from being totally flat and gives it a little bit more life. Cause well, you would say, look at my skin, and say it's one uniform color, really stuff isn't a uniform color. You can see there's different patches on my hand that are whiter or pinker. It's not really a solid gradient from one to the other, but putting a gradient on a character's skin or something like that can just make it feel a little bit more lifelike and alive and natural. And that's something that's obviously easier and faster to do when you're working digitally. And then there are other places where they'll just use some digital effects really nicely to help sell. In this case, for instance, to sell a flashback, they add a little bit of a grainy paper kind of texture over it 
that makes it a little bit more desaturated just to separate it from the artwork that's actually happening in the present moment in the story. Now, I'm gonna have to work hard to not spend an hour just talking about how incredible Young Hyung Il's art is in Blade of the Phantom Master, and there are three main things that draw me into it. First of all, how stylish it is and can be. There are some specific panels where he'll just switch into this very patterny, experimental, and very mesmerizing sort of style. And second, his fight scenes are phenomenal. They're just so cool and epic. The depth in so many of them is so intense. And then mixed in with the really depth heavy images, he's also got some really cool side scroller style panels that are kind of flat, but in a really cool way. And finally, the thing that impressed me most, which is me bringing in some of my own bias, is how fantastic he is at using contrast to really focus the reader on the important parts of an image. And he has so many panels where he shows this off so fantastically. I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of them kinda quickly because I couldn't just pick one or two. There was so much. For instance, this first one of this creature shooting this blast of energy. Everything else in the background and around is gray and black but all of the sections of black in the background are just lightly in there. The only really intense black or white is the creature and the white beam of energy that it's shooting. And it helps the creature stand out even more that it's got some streaks of white in there. There's also white in the explosions on the lower part of the image, but they're mixed in with a lot more grays to keep them from being too high contrast and pulling us away from the main focus. And then just in terms of the action in this scene, even though it's kind of a flat panel, the text here really comes forward as if there's a shockwave coming towards us from this blast, taking this image that could have stayed very, very flat and giving it some extra depth and impact. Then in this next image, this is the one that kind of fascinated me the most, because obviously the biggest point of contrast is this character's face. A lot of his face is in a black sort of shadow, and then part of his face is very strong white. There's not a ton of gray mixed in there, it's very stark black and white. And of course, it's an expression which people are drawn to looking at anyway. But then, in your peripheral, you can tell that there's something else going on in the left, so as you're drawn to the next part, your eye is just sucked right down into our main character. Even though he's not the highest point of contrast, he's where we're going next, because partially all of these streaks and tendrils are circling down right in towards that character. He's also got a little bit of a buffer area around him of white. Not much, but just enough to make his hair and the shadow under his arm a higher point of contrast than some of the other parts around him. Now these next two are two panels in sequence, which I thought were very interesting because they're very similar, but they focus us on different parts of the image. In this first one, well, the highest point of contrast is arguably that white beam near the top because there's white right next to sections of black. We're drawn down to focusing on this character and the sort of energy in his hands because that white streak is bringing us down to him. And then he manages to be a higher point of contrast because he's got some streaky hatch lines in his drawing. He's got obviously an expression which we're drawn to and the weeds in behind him kind of spilling out help frame him and pull us into him. But then when we go to the next panel, which is similar, just kind of a wider version, but has this sort of bird emitting from that energy ball in his hand, that bird is made a much more higher point of contrast and it becomes the main focus because all of the dark black in behind it contrasts with the stark pure white of that bird and makes it the main focus. We do go down to him afterwards, but we're not drawn to him immediately because he's slightly less detailed in this one. He doesn't have as much hatched lines in him, he's more just solid black and white, but the solid black and white isn't as intense of a contrast as in the bird up above him. I could go over a hundred different panels, but I'll end on this concept because it's something that lots of different artists do, and you've probably noticed in comics before, but I've never really talked about it in this series, and that's this sort of halo effect that people will sometimes do around their characters to make sure they're standing out from an environment. Basically, if you've got something in behind the character that's very detailed, 
You don't want that taking away from the fact that the character is supposed to be standing out and generally supposed to be a bigger focus in the image. So what a lot of artists do in a case like that to make sure the character is standing out is just put a little bit of a white or gray or sometimes colored halo around the character to make sure that their line work is really standing out. And that is just a contrast trick to make sure they're a bigger focus. Now, this is the kind of art where I think the context is very important. If you showed me this art and told me it was from a very stone-cold serious series, I would probably think it was really odd and unusual. But in looking at the story for Grappler Backy and some of the things that happen in it, it sounds like it's supposed to be pretty ridiculous and over the top. So the equally ridiculous and even more over-the-top muscles on some of the characters kind of fits. And they really are crazy at some points, especially a lot of the back muscles. On some of the characters even, it's part of the story that some of them have back muscles in the shapes of demon faces. So that probably gives you a better idea of the kind of story we're talking about. And it sounds like it's a total blast. It's a martial arts series with over-the-top muscles and over-the-top fighting, and I thought in a lot of the Western superhero comics I read, there was some over-the-top muscles, but nothing compares to the stuff I'm seeing in this comic. But regardless, I think the main thing that I need to praise Keisuke Itagaki for is his movement. If you're gonna do a series that's about martial arts, you've gotta be really good at expressing movement in your drawings, and he is phenomenal at it. One drawing I really love is this one here, the sort of smoke coming between the two characters and then showing the impact on the other character's back as if this punch has a bit of a delayed hit to it. It's just so big and punchy and punchy and I just think it looks really great. And then one of my personal favorites is this one here. This kick feels like such a big hit and I love how it's just a straight arrow line through the piece, pulling us to the face. And I also like the touch of the movement lines going in behind the character's arm, which makes sense because his foot wouldn't have gone on the other side of his arm and it just helps push the depth a little bit. And even looking past the really great movement in this, he's done a really nice job with the crowd, going from more detailed characters closer to us and slightly less detailed and less and less and less. He put a lot more detail into this crowd than he needed to, and I think it looks really nice. We've got a lot of different looking characters in there, which is a good touch. Now, if solo leveling looked like anime style artwork, then this art I'd have to say looks like video game concept art. It's so beautifully done in this painterly style. All of the environments have so much texture to them, both from the painting and presumably from the artist adding in textures in the digital art process. This is another series that's not afraid at all to take full advantage of digital art effects, both when it comes to texturing the environments and when it, especially when it comes to things like lighting and glow effects. There's a lot of those to pump up a light or an explosion in the comic. But back onto the environments, a lot of them are so beautifully done, and even though they are really simple in a lot of cases, they look more detailed because they're done in this painterly way. I especially like this image here from very early on in the series, that has a very real feel to it because of the texture of the painting, but all in all, if you look at it, it's a very simply done drawing. We have some faded mountains, a wash of gray blue over everything, the clouds, and then our light streak going down with some sort of sonic boom type things following as the characters going down through the environment. And something that I really like about this art is the contrast between the characters and the environment. And this is something I've actually been playing around with in my own art recently. I talked about it in my gym leader drawing the other day. But in this series, the characters, well, they do have a texture to them as well in some of the painted lines on them that are sort of cell shaded shadows but with a bit of a texture to them, they're not as textured as the environments around them. So that makes sure that they stand out from the environments. And yet that can be something that can be hard to find a balance of if you're making too much of a texture difference between the characters and the environment. They can look like they don't fit together, but in this series I think most of the time it works really well. 
Kajime Isayama's Titans in Attack on Titan are probably the most brilliantly horrific monsters I've ever come across in anything. Now I'm more familiar with the anime, but the design transitions pretty seamlessly from one to the other, and they're so geniusly creepy because of how close to human they are. If someone were to interact with something in a story like a really freaky looking bear, you're not thinking that there's a good chance you are going to be able to communicate with the bear or the character will be able to communicate with it because it's a bear, that idea just isn't really there. But with something like the Titans that is so close to human looking, there's that impulse there that you should be able to communicate with it and not being able to and looking at them with their dead eyes and often creepy grins it just makes them so much more horrifying. And then just the overall design of them even more, how their proportions are often warped in a really creepy way where they'll have either really small arms or exposed ribs or exposed teeth, big eyes. It's like Hajime Isayama specifically took people and just thought, how can I warp this a little bit to make it horrifying? And it worked so well. And something kind of funny about the Titans is Hajime actually came up with the design for them after an interaction he had with a very incomprehensible drunk man at an internet cafe. That helped give him the idea for how creepy and weird humans can be. And now, Hajime Isayama is someone who has evolved hugely over the course of making Attack on Titan, and he was a big self-critic early on, and even beyond early on. He's calm down on himself a little bit. And lots of other people have criticized his work, and when you look back at his old stuff, it is very clear how much he's improved. And looking at the old work, I personally don't think there's anything particularly interesting to criticize in his work. It looked like he knew what he was doing in terms of anatomy and perspective, and he just needed to work more at it. And the way he did work more at it and become better at it was by getting a job doing it. It took him a while, but once he found a publisher, he got to keep making Attack on Titan as his main work. And that's a good note for any artist to take away. No matter how much you learn from school or self-teaching or online courses, the time you are going to learn the most and improve the most quickly is when you're actually on the job and being forced to work eight plus hours per day on just your artwork. But something else interesting and noteworthy about his art is for someone who seems like he struggled a little bit with things like faces on characters early on, he's always done a pretty great job with buildings. Especially later on, he's got some really impressive shots of just lots and lots of buildings that show off how well he can render those out. And I'm often more impressed with his drawings of buildings than I am with his drawings of humans. But yeah, overall, he's an awesome storyteller who's improved hugely. And if nothing else, he's given us some of the most horrifying monsters in the history of fiction. I mean, I'd say at least. But all right, everybody, that's all for this episode. Let me know if there's any more manhwa or manga artists you want me to cover or Western comic artists or European or even not comic artists, so maybe we can start branching out a little bit from there. And of course, be sure to check out some of my illustration videos. I recently did My Hero Academia characters if they were Venomized, I've done a few Overwatch characters if they were in Dungeons and Dragons episodes, Spider-Man villains in the Star Wars universe, whole bunch of other art videos. But that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Christian Pearson, this has been Popcross Studios, home of the nerdiest art videos on YouTube, and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye, everybody.